turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 again. So, uh, Acts chapter 2 is a long chapter. You have to know it. I'm going to read verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. You know, this is probably one of the simplest passages in all of Scripture. It's simple to understand. It's simple to apply. It's the clearest description of the church being the church that you're ever going to see. Now, we celebrated Pentecost a couple weeks ago, but in many ways, we should still be celebrating Pentecost because every Sunday is Pentecost Sunday because the Holy Spirit has been poured out. It didn't, it didn't just get poured out one time. They had a good time, and he went away. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. He doesn't, just, he doesn't go away. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God here on earth to lead us and guide us as we live into the mission of the church, which is to make disciples. And in the beginning, I'm going to recap a little bit here. The beginning of Acts chapter 2, the believers were all together in one place. There really weren't that many of them. So they were actually able to be all together in one place. They're waiting for the power promised by Jesus, power from on high. And all of a sudden, very suddenly, the sound of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house. And they saw what looked like tongues of fire resting on each and every, every one of them. And in that moment, they were filled with the Spirit. They heard the gospel in their own language, and they believed. Some of them asked, what does this mean? What's going on here? Others made fun of them and accused them of being drunk. Now, the gospel generally invokes one of these two responses. People were either intrigued and they try to figure out what's going on, or they make fun of them, because it challenges them in ways that they'd rather not be challenged. The methods have changed over the years, the, the names and faces have changed over the years, but the general response people have to the message of the cross fits somewhere in one of those two categories. Peter stands up, you know Peter, attempts to bring some clarity to the crowd. <coughs> now before we dive into what Peter says, it's important to know that Peter's audience has just witnessed the Holy Spirit. They're largely, if not all, Jewish people from a whole bunch of different places, but they're all Jewish people. They're all familiar with the Old Testament. So when Peter stands up and says, this is what Joel was talking about, he hasn't really has explain who Joel was and what Joel was about. They know who Joel was. They know what Joel was about. And when we say Joel, most of you are probably have some awareness of the prophet Joel, that there's a book in the Old Testament called Joel. It's not a total vague thing. And when we go out into the world today, if people see things, if we say that was Joel, what Joel was talking about, most people today aren't going to know who Joel is. They're going to think we're talking about somebody that we know. They're not going to talk about Joel, but in Peter's day, they knew who Joel was. Peter gets to preaching a little bit here. As, as he connects the dots for them, every Jewish person of that day was watching for Messiah. They were waiting for Messiah. Every prophetic word in the Old Testament pointed to the Messiah. And Jesus literally, right on the money, fulfilled every word spoken about Messiah. He is who they were waiting for. But a lot of them missed it because they were unwilling to accept him. They wanted something different than what Jesus was bringing to the table. They wanted it. Their expectations were, were, were radically misplaced. And so now the Holy Spirit's poured out. Which should be further evidence that Jesus is Messiah. And Peter is connecting that dot that they've waited hundreds of years to see connect. And it's a spectacular sight, if you're willing to believe it. I mentioned last week how Peter got on their case a few times by saying that they crucified Jesus. With the help of wicked men, you crucified Jesus. And he does that to make a point. He's not just taking a cheap shot at them. It's the truth. It's what happened. It isn't what they want to hear, but it's what they need to hear. The good news is that as it started to sink in, in chapter 2, verse 37, after Peter declares to them that Jesus is Lord and Christ, 
is that they're cut to the heart. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. They, they, they're like, whoa. Oh, man. And, and in light of that news, they say, what do we do? What do we do? Okay, we just, brothers, what shall we do? We just realized, okay, we just got it really, really wrong. What do we do now? You ever been there? Maybe not so much from a so salvation standpoint, but just something just really wrong just happened within an hour we do. And, and sometimes we have to have a meeting to figure out what to do. <laughs> We're going to put all of our heads together. But brothers, what shall we do? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? Jesus is the Messiah. And in light of that news, the good news, what do we do? The answer isn't complicated. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. The people that he just told, you crucify Jesus. Well, what do we do? Stop. <laughs> Stop thinking that way. You know, you do, what you just saw happen can happen if you turn from your bad attitude. You turn from your attitude, you have to be crucified Jesus and embrace the attitude that he is the Savior of the world. And when you do that, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's a, that's a promise, it says in there. Let me find the verse. Uh, And you, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. That's a phenomenal promise, isn't it? It isn't just for a moment. It's for you. It's for your children. And for all those who are far off, clear on down, so many thousand years later to us, that promise is still for us. It's for all whom the Lord our God will call. Them. That's a big time promise. That promise is for us. It's for you. It's for me. It's for everyone here. It's for everyone out there. We aren't sure what else Peter said, but we're told that he warned them and pleaded with them. Who knows how much longer this sermon was. It would be nice if, if whoever wrote this would have told us, and Peter said this, and Peter said that, but it just said he warned them. He pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. <clears throat> then we're told that a lot of people accepted and embraced the gospel message that day and were baptized. 3,000 people, in fact, baptized in one day. Woo! How'd you like to be there to see that? That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people getting in the water. That's a lot of people getting baptized, getting believed in the gospel. You know, the message is still the same today. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. You know, gener the generation is still corrupt. It always has been. It always will be. The kings and kingdoms, as we, we, maybe we should have sang that song today, the kings and kingdoms will all pass away. The generation isn't going to get less corrupt. The world isn't going to get holier. But it's working harder and harder to convince us that it's right and we need to embrace its way of thinking. The world wants us to think the way they do, that corrupt way of thinking. They don't want to, they don't want us saved from the corrupt generation. They want us to embrace the corrupt generation. Look around. Everywhere you see, they're asking you to embrace a corrupt generation. And it's getting to the point now where if you don't, embrace that corrupt generation. They want to get you in trouble. We're not embracing the corrupt generation. <clears throat> the, world, the world wants us to be devoted to worldly stuff. It's time to save ourselves from this corrupt generation. You see, in today's passage, we see four things. Four things the church did to, def to define itself and differentiate itself from the world. And this is as simple as it gets. The first thing they did in verse 42 that we read about was to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. That sounds simple enough. But remember that many of them were part of the crowd that wanted Jesus crucified. And to go from there, to go from wanting Jesus crucified to being devoted to the apostles' teaching requires a change of heart, a change of attitude, a change of allegiance. Because you can't embrace the world and embrace the gospel at the same time. Now, the world will have you believe that you can. But you can't. You, you just can't. And I'm, that's not me trying to be a jerk. That's just me trying to tell you what, what Jesus has told you. You can't be devoted to the ways of the world and the ways of Jesus. You can't serve two masters, can you? You can't be devoted to this corrupt generation. We just, we just can't be. The second thing they were devoted to was fellowship. That, that's also pretty simple, isn't it? Fellowship isn't complicated. But it does take a certain measure of devotion to commit to being in fellowship with one another. 
It doesn't just happen. You don't just wake up and poof, we're all together. We actually have to get together and be part of the fellowship. And, so, and, and sometimes that means hanging around with people that you really enjoy hanging around with. And, and maybe sometimes, maybe some of you don't always enjoy hanging around with, with, pe with people like me, but we're devoted to fellowship. Are we? It's fun. You, know, you, you, have to, you have to physically get yourself into the presence of others to be part of fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread, which is a clear reference to the Last Supper, to communion. When Jesus told them to do this in remembrance of Him, He meant it. I don't know, as though He didn't really say how often we should do it. He said, as often as you do it, though. And they, they began to do this very early on in the life of the church, and we continue to this very day. We're devoted to the breaking of bread. The fourth thing they were devoted to was prayer. It's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. If these, these aren't ranked in order of importance, I'm not sure which one you'd put any further ahead of any others. But they were devoted to these four things. But we, we talk about prayer a lot. We have a prayer list. We have a prayer time. We open and close meetings and get-togethers in prayer. But how devoted are we to prayer? How devoted are we to these things? How devoted are we to the teachings of the apostles? To fellowship, to communion, to prayer. You know, many churches over the years have spent much time on strategies of how to grow their church. Volumes have been written. Entire sections in libraries and, and, and bookstores have been dedicated to church growth movements and how to grow your church. It's a lot of, a lot of energy gets spent on trying to figure out how to grow a church. And if you can write that book that everybody wants to buy, then you wrote the bestseller. And you can tell everybody how you view your church. But if we look at the church, the very earliest church, this is, the, this is the infant church right here, right after Pentecost. I think we learn all we really need to know. It's about being devoted, isn't it? About being devoted to the right stuff. Teach apostles, teaching, fellowship, communion, and prayer. It doesn't get any simpler than that. When they devoted themselves to the right stuff, then cool things started to happen. You know, the more, the, the older I get, and this is one of the things, um, when you're little, sometimes you don't want to listen to old people because you think they don't know what they're talking about. And, 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 but they do know what they're talking about because they've been around here a lot longer. And the older I get, the more I'm convinced that it really isn't as complicated as some people want to make. Because if you can keep it complicated, then you can make people think that you know what you're talking about, and they don't. And if they believe that, then they're going to listen to everything you say. It isn't complicated, folks. It's just not. It's a matter of devotion and being devoted to the right stuff. Verse 43 tells us, But everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Miracles happen when they're devoted to the right stuff. Good things happen when we're devoted to the right stuff. And verse 44 says, that It would be awesome if this was the case. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Whew. It seems like in our world today, people look for things to disagree about. And they seem to, they almost kind of unite around things to disagree about. And group A gets upset at group B because they can disagree about something that probably doesn't matter. But in the moment, they're really juiced about it. And before you know it, group A has a little bit of a disagreement. group. Pretty soon you've got so many groups that they don't know what they're doing. And sometimes they don't even know what they disagreed about in the first place. But when all the believers were together and had everything in common, they, they even sold their possessions and goods and they gave to everyone that they had in need. They lived together in every sense of the word. If one of them had something the other needed, it was theirs and vice versa. They took care of each other. They, 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 they applied church as if church was a verb. They churched. They were devoted to one another. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And here's the good news. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You don't have to write a book on that. It should, you shouldn't have to write a book to figure out how to be devoted. It's not complicated. It's a simple matter of devotion, right? It's a matter of being devoted to the right stuff. The stuff that grows the kingdom of God. Not the stuff that sells books. Not the stuff that, 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 that anything else is. Teaching, fellowship, communion, and prayer. And if we're devoted to those four things, if we're, if we're devoted to those four things, I believe that God will add to our number. And not that it's about adding to the number. It's about making disciples. Right? It's about, it's about being the church. 
as, as we get ready for communion this morning, as we, as we devote ourselves to the breaking of the bread, and ask yourself what you're devoted to. What are you devoted to? What happens in your life that makes everything else come in second place and say, yeah, uh, if the phone rings and they want this, I don't care what else is going on, that's what I'm doing. That's what you're devoted to. Ask yourself if those four things are the most important four things in your life. Apostles teaching, fellowship, communion, and prayer. What are we devoted to this morning? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for, for the example that we have of the church. Lord, just getting started. Just figuring out what happened, Lord, after Pentecost. Lord, and, and so without having a whole lot to go on, Lord, they, they very quickly found their way to be devoted to the things that grow the kingdom. Lord, and you added daily to their number. Lord, um, we don't need to figure out what's going to make the numbers change. We need to be devoted to you, Lord, and the things you've called us to be devoted to. Fill us with your spirit. Prepare our hearts, Lord, for this supper in your name. Amen.